Well, good morning. Um, so today I am going to talk about some of the research that we've been doing at NDSU um, on the soil health impacts of integrating livestock into our crop systems. This, I'm not going to talk about the forage and like and livestock production pieces. We have that data, but we're going to probably be close on time the way it is just talking about the soil health piece of it. Um, and so in addition to myself involved with this research is Erin Gogler. She's actually speaking this week or during the conference as well. Um, and she's a PhD student working on this research. And we wouldn't, we wouldn't have gotten through a lot of this project without her. We're, we're working with the current project we're working on is working with six different producers and at two of our RECs. And so she is very, very busy and helped keep us on track, especially during the drought when I was pulled other directions. Um, we're collaborating with Dr. Kevin Sedovic, um, the director at the Central Grasslands Research Extension Center and our range, um, our range specialist with an extension. And then Caitlin Landis, she is our, she's also a graduate student on this work. She's also, and our extension agent in Grand Forks County. So just kind of recapping those, those soil health benefits of having cover crops. And I think most people know these. They're pretty straightforward um, and well-documented, well-published. But the first one is just having that soil covered prevents and reduces a, both wind and water erosion. Um, and then that benefits to biodiversity and that we can look at that a few different ways of biodiversity within our cropping system, um, bringing in different types of soil microbes, different plants that function differently, have different bio soil biology that goes with them. Um, we can look at in terms of plant diversity within that system, which kind of pairs well with that soil diversity and then actually providing habitat and food for wildlife. And then um, soil structure, which I think is a lot, the thing a lot of people are interested in, so soil health benefits. Um, increased aggregate stability, um, it helps aerate the soils in some cases, um, and penetra penetration, penetrating compaction layers, which we see in that bottom photo there, when we have some of those brassicas that have the, that deep tap root that can help us break up those compaction layers. In the top photo, we can see that aggregate, increased aggregate stability here, where we have a lot more large aggregates and our, the, the soil is better aerated. We will have better infiltration in that soil. Um, also, as kind of touched on, is that we can, cover crops help feed our soil organisms, increasing that biology and that functioning of that soil, um, increasing with bringing in different fungi, bacteria, which are going to provide different types of carbohydrates and, and that can help release our nitrogen and phosphorus that may be tied up in, in those soils or some of that organic matter in those soils. They cover crops increase earthworms. Is that good? Is that bad? Depends who you ask and what system you're in, probably. So earthworms, good in terms they aerate. They can help with soil aggregation. Earthworms, are they native to North America? Not all of them. And so there's the, if we get into a grazing rangeland system, probably we don't want to see earthworms there because they don't belong there. They actually can disrupt at, um, our plant or ecology and ecosystem there because they're releasing nutrients that will benefit some of our invasive grass species that and and maybe have a negative impact on our native plant species that thrive in low nutrient environments um, and then they can build soil carbon which is needed to create organic matter and kind of plays into that aggregate stability is that organic matter is important for developing that aggregate stability too and enhancing that water holding capacity and holding that nitrogen in place so that it's not leaching out of that system. Cover crop, crop adaptation, it's becoming more, port, more and more um, interest in adapting cover crops across the US. Fortunately, I don't have more recent data than this. This is the most recent data from USDA. Um, between 2012 and 2017, there was a 50% increase in, in cover crop adaptation across the United States. Um, and that was a, that equaled 15.4 million acres. And here, we're in our region, you know, we're doing all right. We're kind of at the, in the topper, or upper, we're two, between that 250,000, 500,000 acres. Um, but if we look at that in terms of that acre, harvestable acreage in those counties, excluding alfalfa, we're actually only one to 5% on average 
of those acres that are incorporating cover crops. So there's definitely some room for improvement there. So what do cover crops provide, or what don't cover crops provide our soils? We've talked about, or provide in general. I mean, we talked about those benefits to, so, to the soils, but what's the gap? What's keeping people from incorporating cover crops into their system? Any thoughts? <laughs> A lot of it's just there's no immediate economic return. We're putting money into those cover crops but there's, there's not a immediate benefit. And it takes a few years to even see those soil health benefits. And so is it worth that investment? And I think that's where our livestock come into play is that we get an immediate return when we incorporate livestock because they are able to utilize that forage and benefit and we get an economic return from investing in that cover crop then. And so kind of the other thing that does, so we got the feed for those livestock and they're loving it. This is from one of our research trials. And then the livestock are actually speed up the rate in which those nutrients, that organic matter is broke, broken down in that system because it's passing through that cow and, and coming out in the form of manure and urine, which are more readily available in terms of urine. And our nitrogen's much more readily available in urine. And then manure is stable a form and compared to some of the other forms that would be in that system. And then also with those livestock, there's different type of biology that's going to come in, in soil biology that's going to be introduced when we introduce those species with, with the cattle and the livestock. And then that benefits our crop growth in, for subsequent crops. And we're going to touch on all of that today. So in North Dakota alone, um, this is from USDA uh, crop acreage reports. From 2019 to 2021, we've seen an increase in 26,000 acres for the annual crops that were planted with livestock in mind, so either for a forage or for grazing. We've seen that decline last year, but I believe that had a lot to do with the 2.4 million acres of prevented plant that we had in the state. And knowing that we don't, I don't have numbers on that, I haven't seen that reported anywhere, that a lot of that did get planted to cover crops because of the flexibility that has now been introduced into the prevented plant policy and RMA allowing, allowing them to be used for livestock forage feed without a penalty before November 1st. Because after the November, but previously that November 1st is the livestock producer, you know, that's not, there's not any quality there. Um, and so, was it worth it then at that time? But now we can harvest those forage, use those forages when they're good quality for those animals. How many of you do ha have livestock? Okay, great. Now I know who to ask questions to. Um, so I'm gonna talk about four different projects and really probably most of the results come from our current SARE project. Um, so we have a soil, there's a soil health and livestock performance project that was done at the Central Grasslands Research Center in Streeter. Um, and this one used mixed species cover crop following a cash crop. So basically a dual cropping system where they had the crash crop, then they put in the cover crop and graze the cover crop. And then I'm not going to talk about this research, but it is available. I kind of want to make you aware of it that they've been doing, uh, we've been doing a lot of research on winter cereals and full season cover crops and just like species selection, what's the quality of those, what's the production of those, what's the best fit depending where you are in the region. The current project that I'm going to focus on a lot is the grazing management impacts on a full season cover crop. Um, so there's a lot of research on grazing or not grazing a cover crop. Not so much on how do we manage those livestock in that system. Uh, so we looked at two different things, stock density with a high stock density, more animals per unit area, and less animals per unit area. Same stocking rate, but um, hoping that that would influence nutrient distribution across those fields. We're still looking at that data. That, pro that piece of the project is really hard for us to replicate because a lot of the livestock producers we're working with didn't have enough animals to get that impact on the fields that we were working on because they were working on 20 acre fields to graze. And we did strip graze, but even that just didn't, we didn't get that density we were hoping to get. The other piece we looked at was utilization rate. Um, so kind of that take half, leave half, a 50% use, or, or a take everything out there. And how does that influence our soil health? 
Then the second project is actually the same project with a, a little another component added to it, where instead of um, we just had the full season cover crop we grazed, this other project, after they were done grazing the full season cover crop, they put in a winter cereal that they grazed in, in the spring. So two grazing periods and no cro cash crop. On both projects, we did this for two years, and then we put corn in as a cash crop this year, just to look at that economic and how does that in it benefit our crop production system potentially. So those are pro the, that project is probably where is going to be where most of our focus is today because that's what I have the most data on. Um, when I talked about the grazing utilization for cover crops, I, wanna, I know when somebody said, you, hears you say, take everything out there, take everything out there that the cow can actually get. <laughs> it's a lot different than actually taking everything out there. Um, so this is actually what it looked like when we were done with our grazing period. So this is our 50% harvest efficiency, which our 50, full use, um, which this is, the, this is our take everything. So we calculated that after, off of a 50% harvest efficiency. Past that, cows weren't really grazing. They're starting to lose. We don't want to push them harder than that. Uh, and then this is our take half, leave half, which was calculated off of a 35% harvest efficiency. So basically, 35% of what's out there is available for forage use, and 50% that was out there for total production was available for grazing in these two systems. But you can see there's not really much difference and ground cover, there's, there's a little bit of more tall height here, but it's an overall ground cover protection. It's pretty good in both, in both situations here, in both scenarios. The only exception was one year we've had, it got snowed and it got wet. So then we had a little bit more of an impact because of that getting trampled and incorporated by the livestock before we could pull them off. So how did you calculate it? that again? Was it based on the livestock? So we went out. No, so, and I can share this, you reach out to me, I, I can help with these calculations. Um, unfortunately, we don't have simple curves. We had to go out, um, cover crops, especially because we had an eight-way mix. Production's highly variable. Um, so we went out, we clipped what was out there to the ground, and then we calculated 30, dried it down, and then 35% of our, 35 or 55, or 50 percent of that dry matter was available for grazing then. And we estimated off of an, um, an intake of 1,200 pounds per animal. And that was just, that's not their traditional stocking. If you were, you, on rangeland, we use 913, but we've noticed with our research that cows have higher intake on cover crops. And so we have adjusted that to match that. But yeah, if you want any of that data, I'm happy to share how we, how we calculated that. And hopefully we'll, in the future, be able to develop some growth curves and estimates, but it's just so tricky because we put this in, but what grew? Did this get too deep? And yeah, there's just so many unknowns in cover crops right now. Um, this is a trial we're just getting started, so I don't have any data for this, but I wanted to talk about it because I'm really excited about this one. So all the other ones are full season fall grazing. This one is looking at rye management in a soy soybean production system. Um, we have a no rye treatment, a rye on, only with no grazing, um, a rye that's going to be spring only grazing, which is what most people do in, in Northern Plains, and then we're going to dual graze. So we're going to graze, we, gra we graze this fall, and then we'll graze again this spring. And s this fall, fortunately, it was so dry, we got like two to five days of grazing. It was limited, but that, we want to get that grazing impact and see what that impact has on that sand. And, the next spring. And hopefully in a normal growing season, if we encounter one, um, we'll have more production and be able to graze a little bit more out there. And this one, we're actually looking at soil biology. There isn't any studies out there that look at soil biology when we in incorporate livestock yet, um, but we're looking at that component in this study. So what I'm going to talk about today then is the soil physical properties, bulk density, aggregate stability, infiltration, and chemical properties. I'm going to focus on the key nutrients, nitrogen, um, phosphorus, potassium, and organic matter. And this is very data heavy, so I apologize for that. But this is the dual cropping system, so that first study. And this is bulk density across the, th the three years of the study. Um, we have our single crop and the dual cropping. 
you see that there is no significant difference in these two years. And this year, we actually seen a little bit of a benefit or a lower bulk density due to on um, that livestock treatment or that graze treatment. Um, similar in our current study is that with these bars, when they overlap, it means we're not different. Um, so there's no difference between our, we had cover crop only, the 50% are lower use, the full use, and we have an annual crop system here. So no difference between those um, on, in terms of bulk density or compaction. I know that's always a question we get. Um, in the Northern Plains, and there's lots of research that shows us that we don't see a compaction issue when we live, integrate livestock in the fall because we're gonna go through that freeze-thaw cycle that's gonna break up that compaction. I mean, an exception would be if you have high clays and it's wet when you're grazing, you might see, see some impacts, but that's more likely in the spring, actually. So we'll hopefully learn more on, with our rye trial and some, if there's any impacts on that when we're spring grazing. Water infiltration, this is highly, was highly variable. In this study, we had working with six producers across six counties. There's lots of variability in the soils we're working with. And so lots of variability, but there is no significant difference across our cover crop only, our two grazing treatments, and then the annual crop system. Lots of variability, but not significantly different um, in terms of water infiltration on those sites. Um, this, now we're looking at aggregate stability. This is that dual cropping system where they had a cash crop and then the the, the cover crop that they grazed, and we've seen across the tr across by the end of the treatment or the end of the project that we had a significant increase in aggregate stability on our two grazing treatments, and a greater increase on that bull use grazing treatment in comparison to our on graze. And this was still cover crop; it just wasn't grazed. Um, this is our current study. I did add so we have. This is an annual, our traditional or annual, annual crop. Um, and this is our baseline. And then this was this fall or this spring when we measured again. And so that did, there was an increase. I'm not sure what the increase was. It's probably a function of what plants were planted there. Um, and then here's our integrated crop baseline across all sites and then our different treatments. And so it didn't significantly increase or decrease from our grazing treatments, but you'll see that we have an increase in our macro aggregates, so those larger aggregates that are more stable. And so that is a, definitely a positive and that we, we're, we see um, across these treatments. So either what, you either have no impact or we have a positive impact in terms of aggregate stability. Looking, moving on soil nutrients, um, this is that first study again with the dual cropping. And we had a year effect for nitrogen, um, but it wasn't a treatment. So it, it, there was no differences between treatments. Um, year effect probably lightly related to climate, um, which is what we see for our current study as well. The, we, there was a significant increase in phosphorus for our 50% use grazing treatment and potassium for our full use grazing treatment. This is our current study. We haven't ran stats yet, but um, can you like, look at the increases? This first year, 2020, the baseline year for all of these is um, following a traditional fertilizer application um, and in 2019. So we would still have that re residual effect of, of that application where during our study, we did not add additional fertility. So there was no fertility added in 2020, 2021, or 2022 across these sites, except for the traditional, because that was just business as usual. Um, so right away, you're looking at this, you're like, oh, this is, didn't help at all. And that's what we were thinking. We're like, oh. And then I remembered, but this has fertility. Um, and so nitrogen was highly variable. You see we had an increase initially, and then a decrease. And does anyone know why that might have happened? So it's because of our drought that started 
in 2020 and lasted, we, even this spring when we sampled, we were still in, in our drought conditions. And so that influenced our nitrogen availability. Um, and then also I, the changes of the form of, of the nitrogen that we ha are, are seeing and being more bound up in our organic matter, which we'll look at as well. Um, but we've seen our, across our treatments that the phosphorus actually was either at or above our baseline levels without, without that fertility. And potassium increased throughout the study and above our requirements, well above. Um, this is, I just want to kind of show a different way of looking at the same data for this study. So 2020 is that our baseline year and 2022. And what I want to show here is that we just had a lot of variability. We had different, we tried to keep soils types the same, but because we were covering such a ge large geographic region, we had similar ones, but not the same. Um, also, you can see we had this really high pre-treatment pre nitrogen. One of our farmers had um, chickpeas planted the year before. So we were seeing that residual impact of that legume there in, in our samples. So there's just, there is a lot of factors, a lot of variability that goes into on-farm research. Um, and that's what's showing up, up in some of our data here. Um, phosphorus, we did same thing, um, not quite as much, but still variable. But we did see again that trend for overall our average increase over time. And this line here is the requirement for 180 bushel corn in eastern, in eastern North Dakota, but non-irrigated, which is just a little bit over 100. Um, and then same thing for potassium, except here's our requirements here. So we're well above requirements. Um, this is for the, the same study where, where we incorporated those winter annuals. And in this study, they're actually haying as well. Um, so what's that removal of that cover crop? How does that influence our, our nutrient dynamics? And so nitrogen, we actually seen a, a significant increase with that full use grazing treatment compared to our other three treatments here. Um, phosphor, there's, the other ones, there's no significant difference. Um, so there's some trends, but no significant differences here. Um, same for potassium. Soil organic matter, um, here's our pre-treatment levels. And we've seen uh, our grazing treatments increase by about 0.75% in just over two years. Um, our cover crop only increased by about 0.5%. And there was a slight increase as well in just the traditional cropping, in that traditional cropping system of around 0.25%. But 0.75% in two years is pretty good in terms of organic matter response. And this is in topsoil. We did look at six to 12 inches, but that just, it, it takes longer to see that impact there. Um, and this is that other, with the winter annual incorporated. And you see that when we were moving that forage, it's really impacting that organic matter component because we don't have that residue that's breaking down into that system. So this is what I think is really cool about this data. Definitely, even though we didn't see that, that nitrogen boost in this past year, this is from our Fargo study location. And since this was on campus, we can manage things a little bit more. Um, and so we actually added a split plot fertilizer application because of fertilizer prices, just to see how did that play into things and what was that benefit. And so these are our no graze here. This is no graze and no fertilizer. Um, this is no graze plus fertilizer. And then these second bars in each color are the there's no fertilizer. So this is our high, high stock density. This is our moderate stock density, which were applied accurately at this location. Um, and you can see that when we add that grazing component, it had a similar impact as, have, as our no grazing but fertilizer, similar performance, similar yield. So I think that's pretty cool to see that. 
And then here's just what those, those ears looked like for, those, for that same chart. So we have that no graze, no fertilizer, um, our 50% use, no fertilizer, but high stock density, 75% in the high stock density. Um, so very, very similar. And so I think that's really powerful is that economic, potential economic savings there. So two years prior of grazing. So we did two years grazing treatments, and then this, this spring we planted the corn. Yeah. Um, so kind of in a summary of the findings from the research that we've been conducting is that incorporating livestock either has a neutral impact or positive impact on our, our soil physical and chemical properties. And to me, what this says is, because all these studies were two to three years, we really need more long-term research and data on the impacts of incorporating livestock into our cropping systems and how that influences our soil health and those properties. Um, and kind of that trend shows that integration of livestock has that potential to enhance soil health, and in higher use may actually increase these benefits. And integrating livestock can create a return on farmers' investments in, in those cover crops. I think that's really a big piece, that's that economic return, not only from maybe those, the benefits and savings in fertilizer, but actually having that forage and extending your grazing season and minimizing the, feed, the dry lot feeding period. Um, grazing cover crops can reduce winter feeding costs and other costs. Um, you know, if we're grazing rye, we're extending that spring grazing period. Grazing a small, and we can get rid of some of those late fall winter feeding costs. We had one of our producers, he grazed into late December one year because he had such high production and his herd wasn't huge. So we had, they were out there a long time. Um, and it can lead to an increase in crop production and yields potentially. The other thing I want to talk, touch on is there, we learned a lot of lessons in this project about integrating livestock, and there's definitely lots of challenges that go with that. Um, and we just maybe show us some very challenging years to work in. So 2020, we started, we had too much moisture and right away and challenging planting conditions. And then we had some of our sites got planted too deep and we didn't have our brassicas represented in that. Um, so that influenced the nutritional quality. The other thing that happened in 2020 is we had a frost, a hard frost on September 5th. And so that tanked the quality of our cover crop and our livestock, we were only grazing cows, so that helped. But in terms of meeting their requirements, it was much more challenging. And I think in those situations, we need to evaluate supplementation and make sure that we're meeting those needs of those animals. With cows, not as big of a deal, especially at that sta the stage of production they were in. But if we were had yearlings on there, something that's needing to grow and gain, we need to make sure that we are supplementing and, meet, and meeting their needs. Um, then we had 2021, which even more fun. Um, we didn't know if our cover crop was going to grow. And then thankfully it was a full season and we got rains and something took off. I and mean, we actually had, were able to graze at all our locations. But we ran into, even though we weren't applying fertility, ran into nitrate toxicity on some of our sites. So then we had to adjust our grazing approach that, for that to make sure that those animals were safe, we weren't having abortions or things like that from those nitrate levels. And so that was, I think that's any, any thing, same thing that you're gonna encounter when you're grazing is you gotta be prepared for those unknowns. If you have something that's a nitrate accumulator, test. Um, it's just better to know what you have and it doesn't cost much to test 20, max around $20 to test for nitrates. So definitely worth just sending that in, knowing what you're dealing with it, knowing that your animals are safe. We also had water issues. Um, one of our producers used this lake to water for his livestock. We were like, okay, we trust you. Um, and he lost a cow because of sulfate. So we had to stop grazing that treatment because that water wasn't, was too dangerous for those animals to use. Um, so there's definitely a lot of planning that goes into this. and. Um, and then, you know, that strip grazing is a little extra work, but 
definitely see a benefit in terms of um, efficiency of use. And there's data out of Nebraska that shows those numbers of additional grazing days that you get when you're grazing with a strip grazing system because you're not, they're not trampling as much. They're not picking out the things they like best and then coming back across and grazing other things. But that's, that's extra work and it all takes time and labor. So there's it's definitely lots of variables when we graze cover crops and, I, and we always want to have a backup plan. So that's really, that, that's all I had to share. Um, I was hoping we'll have some discussion and if you guys have any questions on, on the data that we've, we've gathered so far. Yep. So it's going to, what happens during a drought is, especially if you've applied those, that nitrogen, it's just going to sit there until those plants have some type of water. They can't mobilize and use it unless there's moisture available. Um, but also it affects the availability of that nitrogen too. Um, so that's where the toxicity came from is that those plants, when they're stressed, they accumulate, they accumulate nitrogen and it can reach toxic thresholds because it's accumulating it, but it's not growing properly because it doesn't have adequate moisture. So it can take it up, but it can't use it. And so that's what happens in those situations. Were you using any protein supplementation on those grazing ones, you know, like the tanks or tubs? We didn't in the first year, and then we added it. Um, and since it wasn't on farm, we let the producer do what they wanted to do, like whatever you felt comfortable with. That's something that um, Zach Carlson, our new beef nutritionist, and I have talked about is doing some more research looking at supplementation in our cover crop systems. Because that's definitely another gap out there in that research. But just the quality data we co we've collected, it was, yeah, I mean, it was all dried. It was, it was, not, it was not good. <laughs> it was bad. I know it was it was it was really bad timing on our part, but. Is your intention then to do this to get some long-term data? So we don't have any for this project, but we are doing some other cover crop stuff, and we'll we'll probably we'll implement some of these same treatments just because we need just because of that lack of information on them. Um, we're we're right now looking at trying to get some funding on looking at um, the. the integration of lives of grazing technology, so automatic gates um, d and the virtual fence. So how can we still optimize that, that um, stock density by grouping those animals and strip grazing, making the use more efficient, but um, reduce the labor needs? And no, um, so the, the season long ones we had um, an eight way mix. Um, so there's oats, there's peas, sorghum, sedan, um, millet, we had some sunflowers in there, um, brassicas, so I think we did paja. Um, we did kale one year, um, just was a price of, of kale, and flax. But I think too is like that there's that balance of we're trying to, so when we do that, that season long, we're trying to do something that will for sure grow because you're giving up a cash crop. We want to make sure we have something that will grow that we can graze. And so having that diversity helps address that. Uh, I raise uh, uh, grass fed beef and, uh, or it'd be certified grass fed. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of hoops you gotta yeah. go through. And I'm just, Wondering if grazing cover crop would, would uh, kind of throw off my you know, grass fed certification. I would ask. I don't believe it does though, because it's still grazing. As long as you're not supplementing, is that correct? I don't know. Yeah, I know. If, if you graze like oats too late, then there's uh, good. Stage or something like that. Okay. That yeah. throws that certification. Yeah, 
question. My brother Facebook once told us about that one time. They didn't even want you to be old. Right. So. Every month, just about in my area, everybody uses oats as a nurse crop for alfalfa, mm -hmm. and then we yeah. cut everything for, yeah. for hay because, you know, we try to harvest the oats, then you get a I'm uh, trying to word it now. Well, you get weeds in it, mm -hmm. and you harvest the oats, you get dockage yeah. at, at the elevator, and uh, but then if you, anything you spray to kill the weeds and oats, it'll kill your alfalfa. So, yeah. So, yeah, so in this situation, I think as long as you're grazing it in vegetative, you would be, and it's better quality than anyways, yeah. but in yeah. timing, yeah. Right. Yep. And that timing piece when you're harvesting for hay, you're going to get better quality anyways when you cut it at those wow. stages. Yeah. So. But I've also, back when I dairy, you know, you prove uh, oat hay, the, qual the, the quality wouldn't be very good, but they need it. Yeah, and so one thing we put, like oats, if you put in a field pea, or that's a really good option to, um, that brings up that quality. And it's one of the, the low cost legumes that we can incorporate into our cover crop system. So that's why we use it a lot, because there's lots of other options, but it grows well here and it's low cost. And I think that's one of those things, especially a season long, and you don't know if it's gonna grow. Um, there's always something. so. Keeping it low cost is, is, I think, important when you're thinking about that economic return and what you're putting into that system. I got a question for you. you know, a lot of your data on here, like you said, it was either it having animals on or didn't harm anything, mm -hmm. or it actually improved. Yes. Do you think that there's potentially something from the animal grazing possibly in the manure that is actually helping that soil biology that is, yeah. you know, maybe walk, if you went more years that you even see more of an increase in positive attributes? I, yeah, I think that there's a few different things. So when an animal grazes, so when you think of where the organic matter comes from in the plant, it's from what's in the soil, it's from the roots. Um, yes, the residue on top is going to get there eventually, but it takes a long time to break it down. So one that animal is facilitating that above, down break, above down, ground breakdown, but also when an animal grazes, the roots will break off. It's called senescence, the roots, and that becomes incorporated into that soil. And so that's increasing, that's actually your most rapid increasing organic matters from those, that bro the roots breaking down and senescing. So that's the immediate that, that I see um, in terms of or, organic matter. Um, and then, I, I, yeah, I think that we don't have the data, but there's different, um, there's different biology that comes just from the, what, what's in that animal's room and that's going to get passed out. Uh, and so that's going to feed different things in that, in that system. Um, and then the stability of the nutrients and the different form of the nutrients that they're going to come out as in the, once they pass through that animal. And so the biggest piece is just they're helping break things down faster and making it available quicker. Yeah. Oh, you need to throw in some chickens to get the bugs <laughs> from the manure. Yeah, I don't know. We don't have chickens on campus, so that might be, that might be a challenge. <laughs> But yeah, there's definitely things, uh, most of our research is with cows because that's most representative of what we have in the state and it's a, we also have access to them. Um, but there's definitely other ways we can look at this too and other things we can incorporate. incorporate. And I think it's, beco it's becoming more popular and people are bringing sheep in and, they, and they graze a lot differently. So. And they'll have obviously less, a little less hoof impact than a cow. Yeah, there's def in terms of the research that's out there, there's really a lot, of, it's very limited. It's grazed or non-grazed, or it focuses on the animal production piece, but doesn't bring in that soil health piece. And so that's what we're, our goal is, is to fill in some of those gaps and look at the whole system and not just a piece of that system. One more question. Your corn data, I thought was really interesting. 
Yeah. So that that would be the same. That was the same grazing study. Okay, gotcha. So not it didn't it showed it in the P and the K, but not the N. Sure. But I think that yield shows that maybe <laughs> it was there. It just maybe wasn't in in a form that our animal or that our our tests recognize. Um, and we did have some issues with the lab, our testing lab this year. So that might have been part of part of our part of things. Uh, there's always a challenge with research. Um, yes, so that was, we go, and I don't have those specific sites pulled out, I just have the average. Um, so here's our organic matter though, and the, so those, those grazy treatments were the ones that had almost, uh, they had a, a three quarters of a percent increase in organic matter over the, over the, tre over the trial time or from baseline. Mm -hmm. But a lot of cattle feeders sold their, their siling to the rye crop the next okay. spring. So in terms of that effect, we're not really gaining much benefit for soil health because we're removing that entire crop. Yeah, it's not going to be, yeah, it's not going to be as big of a benefit because you're, yeah, you're not having that grazing impact. Um, at least that's initial, I mean, there's still going to be that benefit and we have seen in our cover crop only at trial that you, and Hopefully, with our, our our rye trial we're doing now, we can answer some more of those those questions. But this this trial here, so this one did have this had rye in part of incorporated in it too. Um, so we definitely see a bigger boost. But we're seeing a bigger boost when we're in, integrating those livestock. But see, but even with the no use with the no livestock, here's our that's just the cover crop by itself. So it's still a benefit. It's just not as big of a benefit because you're still getting that root matter that's breaking down and, and becoming organic matter. But the nice thing about if you have, if you're able to harvest it somehow, you're getting a return from that investment. And if you can graze it, you're getting your animals out of a lot earlier, especially rye, you're getting them out of a lot earlier in, that, in the spring. And it improves health condition, you know, conditions for them. Um, and it's reducing your feeding costs too. Yep. Yeah, that's pretty common here. And that's what we'll do on our study is that the, the no graze treatment as well terminate and plant into it because that's what they're already doing at that research center. And that's most of the where because that's that'll be done in central North Dakota, both of our study sites. So that um, we want to replicate what the producers in that area are doing. <laughs> so, are any of you, I know there was a few livestock producers, are any of you already grazing cover crops? Okay. Thinking about it or have considerations about it or what are some of the things that are maybe keeping you from doing that? <laughs> and so that's that piece like if you can um, set that that's why we clip in ways so we can kind of control that and set that grazing period and pull them off when we get to the point where we want to and that's that's tricky um, it takes and definitely just a lot of guessing in it to it anyways because every cow grazes a little different and depends on their experience with cover crops so our trial we had ones that had grazed cover crops before and were experienced and then we had some naive cows that were older and some younger ones. The young ones did fine, they adapted. We had the, old, the older cows did not want to eat those brassicas. They picked everything else out, did not want to eat the brassicas, and really, which impacted them because that was where we were hoping to get the nutrition from at that time because it was going to be so, it was still green, everything else was dried up, and those cows were, refused to eat it the first year. And then they did eat it the second year, but 
It just took them a little bit before they were willing to try that. And we also had one guy that he, he was, they had a small herd and it was very connected with his herd. And he called us, they'd only been out like two days and they weren't even close to when they needed to be moved. And he was like, my cows are crying. And so it's like, just ignore them. Wait till you get closer to the, the day. They're not used to it, they'll, they'll be fine. <laughs> and, the, and the second year they were, it was better, but he was just like that trial of like, this isn't something his cows were used to. And, but really good experience uh, most of the, those that we had worked with that hadn't grazed cover crops are planning on continuing it. Um, one guy, his father-in-law came out to our tour and he said, like, I didn't think this was gonna work. And they had great experience. They're the ones that grazed till December. They fall calved out on it and, it, and it's something they plan on continuing to do. And it, especially with the drought last year, it did give, even though we had some challenges with nitrates, it gave them some extra grazing and relieved pressure on their pastures so they can move those cows off those pastures. And so really looking at that whole systems approach, increasing the resilience of our grazing system overall and, and reducing that impact on our pastures so they could recover from the drought a little better. They're probably only crying when they sue somebody. Well, we've seen that on ours, even. We go out there and they're all like, head to the head to the fence line to see if we'd move them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Because I know, like, when we talk with people, it is. It's hard. It's a big commitment. You have the fencing, especially. Um, and just that extra labor that goes into it, the extra costs. But if you're gonna put do cover crops here already, it's definitely worth worth it. <laughs> and water is always a big issue. Fence, I think it's the infrastructure and having that infrastructure in place and that investment in infrastructure. So, for example, if you use cover crops in the field, do you uh, feed the, I mean, the animals directly or when you harvest them, you feed them separately? These were all grazing. We're bringing the animals out there. Oh. Um, yep. So they don't feed really for the construction? So, yeah, there, we, all the study, or most of the studies we've done, we graze in the fall. And so in the Northern Great Plains, we go through a freeze-thaw cycle, obviously. This week is a very good example of that. Um, and so because of our, the clays in our soils, they shrink and swell. And that shrinking and swelling as they go through that freeze-thaw cycle helps to break that compaction. Um, as we go south, that's definitely a bigger concern. But here with our climate, it actually, there's one benefit, at least one benefit of it being cold, besides no mosquitoes right now, <laughs> right? So. That's, that is, um, there's research that has been done out of the ARS station at Mandan that looked at that extensively. And, and all the trials we've done too, um, bulk density hasn't increased significantly under our grazing treatments. Um, the exceptions are spring grazing, if that soil is saturated and you have high clay content, you're going to have some compaction issues. And so, I, I mean, it's just one of those things is, you know, knowing your soils, knowing your fields, and if you're, you know, delaying grazing or getting those animals off of that field to reduce that. And there's been research out of Nebraska too, long-term research looking at compaction as well. And there was, they haven't had, they don't have any negative results for that either. And the, their soils are a little sandier, so okay, that makes sense. <laughs> But yeah, that, that's definitely the biggest concern we see or hear of is the, the compaction piece. And so far, we haven't seen any evidence of that in our research. And there's a lot, and even, you know, research from the Northern Plains in general. 